1955, New York publishing house Dodd and Mead first published a unique work entitled God Speaks, written by the Indian spiritual master Meher Baba. In this moderately sized book, Meher Baba not only tackles the ancient mystery of why we are here, but explains in methodical detail the beginning of creation, the evolution of consciousness, and the goal of all life. The goal, as the book explains, is the achievement of God's wish to know his divinity consciously, to join and reunite with God in the perfect realization that all are one. Amazingly, the author of this work kept verbal silence for the last 44 years of his life. Meher Baba dropped his physical form in January of 1969, and although no actual religion has emerged in his name, his followers, who continue to number into the hundreds of thousands, believe he was God realized. God Speaks is his highest, most significant published work. I had read a lot of books on spirituality, and I had never seen anything like God Speaks. It immediately struck me as the most authoritative book on the planet. My experience of reading God Speaks is, it, is a, it lightens one's suffering. When I read it, I said, this is unbelievably comprehensive. It tells the entire story. Nobody tells the entire story. Father had asked a number of people to read God Speaks, and he made it known that he wanted people to read it and try to read it and understand it. So motivated by that, many people have picked it up and then found it really difficult to get through. I think that the uh, way it's presented is to change the consciousness of the person who reads it. And Bob is working at very deep levels through those words and through the person's attempt to understand and make sense of what's being read. It's certainly not something you take along for light reading on the beach. The naturalist Charles Darwin has suggested that all life originated from an ancient common ancestor. And although his theory of natural selection may accurately describe the physical evolution of species, it does little to explain how or why creatures got here in the first place. Meher Baba's God Speaks explores evolution from a different perspective, from the basis of consciousness. It maintains that it is consciousness which drives evolution. The book begins by declaring that all souls are essentially one. All souls were, are, and will always be in the Oversoul, commonly known as God. All souls, unlike our external physical forms, are infinite, eternal, and formless. And although there is no difference in souls, there is a difference in their consciousness. This is because each soul has different and diverse impressions. These impressions, also known as sanskaras, are the basis of our habit patterns. They are of three different kinds, gross, subtle, and mental. Souls of gross impressions have consciousness of the gross or physical body and have experience of the gross world. Our experiences include seeing, hearing, smelling, eating, and sleeping. Souls of subtle impressions are advanced on the spiritual planes and experience the subtle world, the world of energy, through the subtle body and have only the experiences of seeing, smelling, and hearing. Souls of mental impressions through the mental body or mind experience only seeing and this seeing is the seeing of God. Souls having no impressions experience the infinite power, infinite knowledge, and infinite bliss of the Oversoul. Our physical organs of hearing, seeing, and smelling are useless for experiencing and enjoying the higher planes. And the seventh plane stands unique. Here, sight and smell are divine in essence 
and have no comparison to those emanating from the lower planes. In this plane, one does not hear, smell, or see, but one becomes sound, smell, and sight simultaneously and is divinely conscious of it. This is God-realization. In order to gain this God-consciousness, the soul must lose consciousness of the gross, subtle, and mental bodies. These bodies are finite, have form, and are destructible. They are false, zero, imagination. Only the soul and oversoul are real. Ironically, the infinite, eternal, formless God as drop soul within the dream of creation finds itself as finite, mortal, and having form. It is only through the experience of apparent separateness that souls can consciously realize their indivisible oneness as the Oversoul. God Speaks really did articulate and, and spell out so many of what to me had been mysteries. The kingdom of God is within you. So, I mean, it helped put things together. You find what is the goal of life, how the creation took place, what is the purpose of creation, and what we have to do, what is the ultimate aim of the life. So you get this understanding through God Speaks. It is not that if you read God Speaks thousands of times, you will not become God. You have to experience. The spiritual path, uh, Mirababa has also talked about how it's not so much a marked out highway as uh, the trail left by someone who is hacking um, his way out of a jungle. And so, in that sense, the spiritual path is going to be different for everyone and it will never be duplicated. I think the m most beautiful part is that God alone is real and he is the oversoul that contains you and me and all the little drop souls. <laughs> I mean, that's enough to meditate on for the rest of your life. Meher Baba compares the Oversoul to an infinite, limitless ocean, and the individual drop soul, although never existing out of the bounds of this limitless ocean, is shrouded by a bubble of ignorance. In the beginning, God had no consciousness of gross, subtle, and mental bodies and was also unconscious of its own self. This infinite, impressionless, unconscious, tranquil state of the Oversoul reverberated with impulse, which can be called the first urge or whim to know itself consciously. This most finite urge was restricted to a finite point in the unlimited ocean, through which the shadow of the infinite appeared and went on expanding. A bit like the Big Bang Theory of Creation, Meher Baba described this event as a sort of eruption, disrupting the indivisible poise and unconscious tranquility of the infinite soul with a tremendous shock. This shock impregnated the unconscious soul with first consciousness and apparent separateness from the indivisible state of God. Simultaneously, the very first impression emerged objectifying the soul as the absolute opposite and most finite, gross counterpart of the infinite. Impressions give rise to experiences, and to experience the impressions, the use of appropriate media is needed. Therefore, the consciousness of the soul begins to associate with physical form. After starting with subgaseous and then gaseous forms, the soul then begins to identify itself as stone. Even in these rudimentary forms, which appear inert and without life, there are innumerable variations, and the consciousness of the soul must utilize each and all of these as appropriate media, one after the other, in accordance with the soul's diverse impressions. After ages and cycles of experience, a stage is reached where the consciousness of the soul dissociates even from the very last species of stone form and in order to experience these impressions, associates and identifies with a new medium, the metal form. 
This medium of metal is actually the mold of the impressions of the very last species of stone form. This is how consciousness evolves. Higher and higher physical forms are adopted through which the impressions of the dissociated forms of the lower species are experienced and exhausted. Obviously, if I'm a gas molecule, there are other gas molecules around, and they bump into one another. And the product of those bumpings, because those are fundamental, simple experiences, and of course, they create impressions. And that impression, as Baba points out to us, has to have a form through which to express itself. So a form that is apt and suitable for the expression of that impression is gathered or attracted by the impressions. And if the impressions continue to uh, multiply and to complexify, of course the form becomes more and more complex uh, inevitably. And that allows all of this increasing complexity, allows more and more complex and sophisticated consciousness to be generated. After the soul has experienced all of its necessary impressions as metal, the last metal form is shed. The consciousness of the soul now identifies with the vegetable form, which is nothing but the consolidated mold of the impressions of the last associated metal form. This form has half inanimate and half animate attributes. Although it cannot stand independently by itself, it uses the support of other media to assert its upright stand. To go from impressions that were made in a metallic form and suddenly jump to a body which is a vegetable, from, from metal to vegetable, it, it just seems incredible that there can be suddenly such a jump. A little tiny voice says, Don, despite your chemistry studies, you've probably forgotten now that the central atom in the chlorophyll molecule, which is central to the life processes of the vegetable, that atom is magnesium, one of the most commonly occurring metals, of course. And then all of a sudden the little voice says rather wistfully, and I bet you've forgotten also that iron is the key central atom in the hemoglobin molecule. So there we've got two terribly important bridge overs. The process of evolution of consciousness concerns the evolution of forms only and not the actual souls. The souls remain as indivisible and infinite as the unlimited ocean from the beginning until the end of evolution of consciousness. Forms of higher and higher types evolve, which are suitable for the expression of impressions and are the base by which the soul gains higher and higher consciousness. Next, the soul identifies with the first species of worm form, which is nothing but the consolidated mold of impressions gathered in the final species of vegetable form. In addition to the various species of worms, insects, reptiles, and amphibians can all be categorized as being at this same level of form and consciousness. When the soul reaches the worm form, it experiences itself as an animate creature with voluntary movement. The worm conscious soul also realizes more acutely that it must struggle for its sustenance and survival and that it is endowed with sensation and life. Impressions must necessarily be exhausted through experience, and to get experience, a suitable medium is necessary. Therefore, the soul will then identify itself with the first species of fish form in order to experience and exhaust the impressions of the last species of worm form. The fish conscious soul experiences itself as a living creature in water a vertebrate endowed with life, sensation, and voluntary motion, also struggling for sustenance and survival. With the further evolution of gross consciousness, the sanskaras, or impressions, also increase and cause the soul to assume or associate with a still more complex gross form. 
What God Speaks does is goes right with the whole notion of evolution, but provides the reason behind it, the, the meaning behind it, which is that evolution is not just an evolution of form, it's an evolution driven by the needs of consciousness. And unlike Darwin, that viewed consciousness as a side effect of the evolution of form, what Baba explains is that form itself is driven to higher levels of sensitivity because of the needs of consciousness to become conscious of itself. Once the impressions of the last species of fish form are experienced and exhausted, the soul then associates with another suitable medium, the first species of bird form. The bird realizes itself as a feathered vertebrate, capable of flying in air and with the help of two legs, maintains an erect stand. This chain of successive associations and dissociations with varied and countless forms moves onward steadily and progressively. These associations and dissociations of the soul are absolutely essential to keep the wheel of evolution of consciousness revolving. The first species of animal form is nothing other than the consolidated mold of the impressions of the last species of bird form. The animal form usually appears as a quadruped organized being, endowed with life, sensation, and voluntary motion. It too must struggle for sustenance and survival, sometimes as an herbivorous creature and sometimes as a carnivorous one. The animal form has no erect or upright posture and has a tendency to look down with drooping head. Apes, however, the most evolved type of animals, tend to stand erect like human beings. When a form is shed by the conscious soul, the form is said to have dropped or died. Now, without form, the consciousness of the soul is centered in the impressions of the form which has just been dropped or discarded. And as long as consciousness is centered in impressions, the soul must necessarily take experience of those impressions, and so it associates with the next species of animal form. Here, the consciousness of the soul begins to experience the impressions it had gathered in its previous form. Experiences opposite in nature are absolutely essential to exhaust impressions. Only opposite experiences can shake up the roots of these thickly set or firmly established impressions. Eventually, the consciousness of the soul dissociates from the very last species of animal form, and its identification with the next form is known as the birth of a human being. At this point, the evolution of consciousness is full and complete. It's my feeling that in reality, Darwinian thought probably fits very neatly into creationism with a few tweaks to both. A God or infinite power behind the beginning of the evolution of forms is the master concept and that Darwinian evolution gives a little glimpse of how evolution actually takes place. According to Mayor Baba, once consciousness is achieved by the soul, this consciousness goes on evolving more and more and can never be lost or devolved. In the worm, bird, and fish forms, instinct began to develop, and in the animal form, instinct is fully manifested. At the human stage, this instinct is completely transformed into intellect. However, because of the burden of gross experience, it is still not conscious of its true self and does not experience infinite knowledge, power, and bliss. Nor is it conscious of its subtle and mental bodies and so cannot experience the subtle or mental world. When we are conscious about this gross, gross world, we just think that this is normal consciousness. So normal consciousness means that is 
the consciousness of the gross world. And this gross world, we, we experience material things. We have to lose this gross consciousness in order to um, have subtle consciousness and experience subtle world. In order to experience mental world, we have to lose subtle consciousness and then have mental consciousness and experience the mental world. And then beyond that is God, the infinite cons consciousness, the reality. Through its association with the gross body, the soul seeks to exhaust its previously accumulated opposite impressions, but rarely succeeds in doing so. On the contrary, it often accumulates fresh impressions of opposites. When the gross form is about to exhaust the impressions which brought it into existence, it is dropped. The association with gross forms is termed birth, and the dissociation from gross forms is termed death. However, there is no death. The consciousness of the soul retains and experiences the impressions of the dropped or dissociated human form through its subtle and mental bodies. The state of the soul in the apparent gap between death and birth is generally called hell or heaven. These are states of intensive experiences of the impressions of events gathered from the lifetime just terminated. The soul itself does not actually go to a place called heaven or hell, as is the general belief, because the soul is eternally infinite and eternally within the oversoul. If the predominant impressions are of virtue or goodness, then the soul is said to be in heaven. If the predominant impressions are of vice or evil, then the soul is said to be in hell. It is the consciousness of the soul which experiences the impressions, and these impressions are retained through the subtle and mental bodies. Although the soul frequently and consciously dissociates itself from the finite gross forms, it never dissociates itself from its finite subtle form and its finite mental form. When you drop the body, so 40 to 72 hours, you remain in a astral world, connected with the surroundings where you drop the body. Just like now you have more good impressions, so you enjoy high one state. And high one state, there, there is no place. It is just the state of the mind. In the phase after we drop the physical body, we then have a chance to sort of, you know, we're done with our field's work. We now have a chance to go back into the study and look over all of the different things that we did, all the different interactions that we had, and evaluate them against our higher learning and our highest learning and understanding in order to see where, you know, we didn't quite get it yet, where we have to give some more attention and to integrate and, and consolidate the learning that we have done um, in order to, to carry that forward. After experiencing either heaven or hell, and when a complete balance of experiences of opposites is just about to be maintained, the consciousness of the soul takes another birth to experience and exhaust the residual opposite impressions of the last incarnation. Complete balance is lacking in death as well as in birth. It can only be achieved in the gross world. Therefore, an endless chain of lives in the gross sphere is sustained by residual impressions until consciousness succeeds in establishing itself in impressionless equipoise. The process of association and dissociation of consciousness is termed the reincarnation process. While this gross conscious God in the man's state experiences the opposites in the gross world, he reincarnates innumerable times, sometimes as a male, sometimes as a female, in varied castes, creeds, nationalities, and colors, and in different places and continents, always reviewing opposite impressions and exhausting them by experiences of opposites. It's interesting that Baba had said that normally people are not given the experience of their past lives. 
because it could be distracting or confusing. And only if it was really a help in their path would they be able to remember a past life. Reincarnation was part of the earliest uh, Christian teachings. Reincarnation is taught in Judaism. There's a whole description of life after death and reincarnation in, in the Jewish mystics. And the parallels between what's in these esoteric Western teachings and what Baba describes, it's the same thing. An obvious lesson of God speaks is that consciousness does not die. The physical body does serve a purpose, but is not the repository of consciousness. The important perspective here is the understanding that everything we do matters, even if it doesn't matter very much, and that the evolution of consciousness, our spiritual path, continues over many, 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 many lives, and is very, very meaningful. After the long process of many reincarnations, the opposite impressions eventually thin out and become less concentrated. The fully evolved consciousness is now ripe for disentanglement from the gross world. At this point, it enters the spiritual path and turns inward. Its gross impressions are now less deep. They have become fainter or more subtle, and the soul now becomes subtle conscious. This is the first step in the involution of consciousness. Involution is possible only when the individualized consciousness of the soul becomes disillusioned with the incessant experiences of the material or gross life. In the subhuman stage, the evolutionary process of form and consciousness is involuntary, yet sustained and continuous. In the human stage, the spiritual progress of man through the reincarnation and realization processes is significantly voluntary. During involution, the soul crosses six planes. The first three belong to the subtle world. The fourth is on the border of the subtle and mental world, and the fifth and sixth belong to the mental world. At the outset of this path, through its fully developed subtle body, the soul experiences partially the first plane of the subtle world, experiencing subtle impressions with gross senses. With its gross eyes, the soul sees glimpses of the subtle plane. With its gross ears, hears celestial music of the subtle plane. With its gross nose, enjoys subtle scents. Gradually, the gross conscious soul entirely experiences the first plane of the subtle world. At this stage, it is no longer gross conscious, but rather subtle conscious. It can still, however, use the gross body through various aspects of the gross, such as eating, seeing, and feeling. And it can use the mental body through various aspects of mind, such as desires, thoughts, and emotions. The subtle conscious soul on the second plane has gained consciousness of the infinite energy of the subtle world and is capable of performing tricks or minor miracles of a lower degree. With one wish, they can make a dry tree green or fill a dry well with fresh water. They are now totally unconscious of the gross world, although from all outward appearances, they remain in function as ordinary people, eating, sleeping, and having feelings of pain and pleasure. Yet at this stage, the soul experiences not the gross, but the subtle world, and creates fresh, subtle impressions only of seeing, smelling, and hearing. Further involution of the subtle consciousness results in the experience of the third plane. Here, greater consciousness of the infinite energy of the subtle world is gained, and the soul is capable of performing grand miracles, such as giving sight to the blind or restoring limbs to the maimed. When one on a particular plane, with his consciousness gradually involving, becomes completely dazed by the enchanting experiences of the plane, he is commonly known as a must, meaning that he is God intoxicated.
There are uh, different types of spiritual experience and the distinction between intoxication and sobriety which, uh, which Mayor Baba has used to talk about the must, and of course the term must means intoxication, intoxicated in, in, in Persian. Um, this has a long tradition of discussion in, um, in Sufi psychology, and there are a lot of analogies to be found in, in Indian uh, traditions as well as in uh, Christianity, holy fools. Uh, the, uh, the notion of, of people who have been overpowered by uh, God to such an extent that their reason has departed. Uh, I think that's fairly widespread, although for the most part not as, uh, not nearly as uh, elaborately worked out and explained in detail in reference to a, a more comprehensive system or, or uh, map of, of spiritual advancement. If one does not get overpowered by the experiences of the plane, but continues to maintain his poise throughout, he is said to be a salik. Such a salik behaves like a very normal man of the world, even though his consciousness is progressively involving and is completely dissociated from the gross world. The journey between the third and fourth planes is at once difficult and dangerous, because between these two planes there is the point of enchantment. Unless the pilgrim gets out of this state quickly and proceeds onward to the fourth plane, his progress will be held up indefinitely. The fourth plane is partially of the subtle world and partially of the mental world. Now fully conscious of infinite energy, the soul is confronted by the full blast of intense desires and emotions. Here, the soul is equipped with full power and is, according to Mayor Baba, even capable of raising the dead and of creating new forms and worlds breathing with life. At this stage, one finds oneself between the devil and the deep. The overpowering enticement to wield and use this infinite energy at will proves a treacherous foe at this juncture, termed in Christian mysticism, the dark night of the soul. The fourth plane is the first time when the what should I say, the reincarnating drop soul on his return to God can tap into the unlimited energies uh, which can do real damage in creation. When one is on fourth plane, he has got the infinite power, infinite power of God. He experiences that, and when, but knowledge is not there, so he can and the temptation, when the power is there, the temptation is there. So he can misuse the power. And that's why Baba has given um, um, that um, importance to this, that they is, it should be checked. And there are always masters, perfect masters, and they take care. Because it is a very dangerous plane. When, if you misuse the power, what happens that you go to the you go back to the stone age, you become stone. And that's why it is most important, very serious thing. And always the master's check. Normally, when consciousness is once gained, it can never be lost. However, the case of the fourth plane consciousness is the only exception. If by overcoming the temptations of lust and fame, one makes good use of the powers, or refrains from using them altogether, he or she arrives at the fifth or sixth plane, where there is no further possibility of downfall. The fifth and sixth planes of consciousness are of the mental sphere of the mind. At this stage, the soul is master of his mind, whereas in the gross and subtle worlds, when gross and subtle conscious, he was the slave of his mind. On the fifth plane, the state of mind is inquiring or reflecting. In this state, mind functions as thoughts, high thoughts, low thoughts, good thoughts and bad, thoughts of every kind, type and state. In the sixth plane, also of the mental world, the state of mind becomes impressive or sympathetic and functions as feelings, feelings of sufferings, emotions and desires, and has no thoughts at all. 
The soul can, however, utilize the gross through various aspects of the gross and is seen eating, sleeping, seeing, hearing, and feeling as an ordinary gross conscious human being, though conscious only of the mental world. He now longs for union with God, having the experience of seeing God everywhere and in everything, in everything that is, except his or her own self, because being still conscious of mind, the sixth plane soul has not yet shed the ego and is still in the domain of duality. Now with only a faint last trace of residual impressions remaining, duality lingers until the final involution of consciousness, in which the soul will associate itself with its own true self. When the sixth plane of the mental world is transcended, illusion vanishes and God is realized. At this stage, all impressions have disappeared completely, enabling the soul to become conscious of itself as the ocean. Here on the seventh plane, the initial urge for self-knowledge is fulfilled, and the soul is now conscious of itself as God, experiencing infinite power, infinite knowledge, and infinite bliss. The soul, now devoid of ignorance, realizes its eternal existence in the infinite ocean, as the ocean itself, as the Oversoul. The resolution is so immense. At the end, it's self-realization. It, it's the realization of the whole purpose of life, which is to love God and to become God, become one with God. And th this was immense. You know. To cross the sixth plane and experience the seventh plane by one's own efforts, however, is quite impossible. At this stage, the grace of a perfect master is absolutely essential. Perfect masters not only experience infinite power, knowledge, and bliss, but can also use these attributes for the emancipation of other souls still unconscious of their own eternal reality. The perfect master radiates an atmosphere of bliss in his immediate vicinity, an atmosphere that a stranger in search of it cannot help feeling. Another sign of perfection is its power to adapt itself to any level of humanity. It can be as nonchalant on a throne as in a gutter. There are at all times five of these perfect masters on earth who render spiritual service and benefit to the whole of mankind. Although perfect masters often function completely unknown to the public, many of them attain wide public recognition. It seems like the perfect master is the, is the unique, God-realized person who is there to help others attain God-realization. The only knowledge is the knowledge of the uh, perfect master, that science can't get there. The soul of the master is connected with God beyond, which is often described by Sufis as Allah, by Zoroastrians as Ahramazd, by Vedantists as Paramatma, and by Christians as God the Father. The beyond state is simultaneously the latent infinite consciousness and the latent infinite unconsciousness of God. The master's soul is connected with the God state, the three worlds, and all the souls, whether they are mental, subtle, or gross conscious, as well as souls who are in the pre-human evolutionary stage. The subtle body goes on developing until it is fully developed in the human form. Simultaneously, instinct is developed. Intellect, in its partial development, makes its first appearance at the animal stage but the mental body appears only at the last stage, represented by the human form. When the human soul launches upon the process of realization, intellect is replaced by inspiration. Baba asked me when I was seated with him in Mandalay Hall was whether or not I had read God Speaks. And I mentioned that I started, I was reading it, 
The Bible said it was very good. He said that I should read God Speaks again and again. And then he made a gesture like this, till I feel it singing in my veins. That's the way he put it. It may, may be, there may be a slight hum, but it's not singing yet. Really speaking, how one finds God, how one reaches Godhood, it is only through love for God, pure love. This is the only way to reach God. And, and that, that love, it is different from material love. Love is that divide of desires and thoughts. That is love. Truth is beyond the faculty of reason and far above the sphere of intellect. But in God Speaks, Meher Baba has declared that we can become God for the simple reason that knowingly or unknowingly we are God. As long as our ignorance remains, there will be no end to the plural diversity of illusory things. When divine knowledge is gained, one realizes there is no end to the indivisible oneness of God. As I understood it from Baba, and he repeated the story two or three times, so I think this is fairly accurate, he had been giving notes over a period of time to his old schoolmate, Dr. Abdul Ghani Munsif, Dr. Ghani as we always called him. Uh, unfortunately, uh, Dr. Ghani died in 1951 uh, of a heart attack. And immediately uh, after that, he had one of the Mondali go to Dr. Uh, Ghani's quarters and uh, get out the manuscript, which presumably he had been writing for some time. Uh, when some of this was read out to Baba, Baba was rather nonplussed, startled, and said, uh, well, uh, it's interesting, but this has nothing to do with what I was giving Ghani and had expected that he would be writing. In this case, of course, Baba decided that he simply had to start right from the beginning and redo, or rather do for the first time, to be more accurate, uh, the work that he had intended. So this, he would dictate during the daytime uh, quite some considerable body of notes to Arish, uh, who would take them down, and then Arish would work at night. The following morning, he would then go back to Baba, and the first order of the day would be for Arish to read out the elaborated material that he had done. Well, back in Myrtle Beach in 1952, Baba told Mother that he wanted her to publish his book that became God Speaks. In the fall of 54, Lud Dimple returned from the men's meeting, and he brought Baba's manuscript to Mother with instructions to edit and publish it and work with Don Stevens on it. What did Ivy Deuce and Don Stevens do? How did they handle the material put in their hands? Did they have any guidelines or rules? Did Bobby impose anything? Bobby didn't impose anything at all. He didn't say, do this, do that, be careful you don't do that, and so on, you know? I mean, it's absolutely incredible to hand over a work of that fundamental importance and have the perfection to be able to resist all the be carefuls and so on, you know, that uh, normally an author would. If I remember, Baba gave uh, Mercia Deuce and myself six or seven weeks to do the necessary editing and get it quickly over to him for a final look-see and then back over to Dodd Mead to, to be printed. But how did it all begin? Meher Baba describes the beyond the beginning, the original state of the beyond beyond state of God. This is the original state of God is, where unbounded absolute vacuum prevails. The pure essence of God in the beyond beyond state is not conscious of anything, not even of itself. In God Speaks, Meher Baba has explained the beginning of creation as being nothing but the whim of God to know his divinity consciously. 
This original whim can also be described as the first word uttered by God. Who am I? The whim as a expression of uh, divine creativity is, is a beautiful concept. And it gets, around, it gets away from two of the alternatives of more traditional philosophy, which are, uh, number one, that it was uh, enforced upon God by the nature of things. In other words, that it was not really a um, deliberate uh, creative act. Uh, in that sense, uh, the world, God, nature, everything becomes simply a, a kind of a semi-mechanical process. Um, or other people said, is it simply a matter of chance? Um, and it just happened anyhow. Um, with, the, with the whim, you have something that is spontaneous, that is not enforced or caused by necessity, uh, but it is not random. It is creative. The most finite point from which illusion projects is called the creation point, or ohm point. Manifesting as infinite creation, this illusory universe gradually expands ad infinitum. God now experiences the divine dream, identifying and associating with everything in the field of cosmic evolution. In a sense, God receives apparently real, but actually false answers to the first word, who am I? Such as, I am stone, I am metal, and so forth, and finally obtains the answers, I am man, I am woman. Eventually, God gets the real answer to the question of who am I, as I am God, finding that he alone ever was, always is, and eternally will remain, the only reality. The original absolute vacuum state of God, which once prevailed, is now experienced consciously. Once conscious realization of reality is gained, it is retained eternally. When Baba dictated God speaks, and he gave the dedication, dedicated to the illusion of the universe, which sustains reality. Bab Baba himself gave this dedication. Baba said, how well do you understand God speaks? So uh, my answer was, Baba, you know better than I how well I understand God speaks. So Baba went like that. I said, what does that mean? Eric said, not bad, pretty good. Twenty years later, I was visiting Mira, and uh, she said, uh, have you read God Speaks? And I said, oh, yes. Baba says, I understand it like this. And she said, oh, not at all. <laughs> Apparently, th uh, this is a pun. It also means <laughs> zero. <laughs> Ah, uh, Bob is so funny. Part 10, I think it was, where Bob pointed out, you know, if you didn't understand a word of this book, it doesn't matter. God is to be lived, is to be experienced, is to be accessed through love. Meher Baba states that there is no general rule or method for God realization. Everyone must work out their own salvation and must choose their own method, although their choice is mostly determined by the total effect of their impressions. When an aspirant has intense longing for truth, he is qualified to enter the path. According to God Speaks, God appears on Earth in human male form once every 700 to 1400 years. When God manifests on Earth in the form of man, and reveals his divinity to humankind, he is recognized as the avatar. Historically, Zoroaster, Rama, Krishna, Buddha, Jesus, and Muhammad. Born in 1894, 
Meher Baba has declared that he is the most recent incarnation of the avatar. The avatar is infinitely capable of giving a universal push in consciousness to all things, all creatures, and to all mankind. Anybody who could write a book like God Speaks had to be somebody. It was not your average off-the-street author. It was someone who clearly knew. And who could know about the beginning of the universe with authority? Not many figures. Like so much else of Baba, <clears throat> it makes the most sense. It, it simply fits. It's, uh, <clears throat> it answers a lot of unasked questions and also helps to rectify other points of view which aren't as fully developed. And I mean, if um, simple consistency of doctrine was the ultimate point of the spiritual path, it would not be a very interesting spiritual path. And uh, the ability of words to contain the vastness of, uh, of reality is, is limited. But rather than a book, uh, it becomes your life after a while, and you, you realize that you're a part of that process, and you are that process. A thousand seekers may be enjoying a thousand different experiences, yet the path of Gnosis is only one. God is one, and it is He alone who exists. As Meher Baba declared, God alone is real, and we are permanently lodged in the Divine Beloved. We are all one. <laughs>